Hello. Welcome to another episode of Zero the Educate. In the past years, there have been a series of defaults and downgrades in the bond markets, which has served as a rude awakening to investors. These credit events have shown that debt isn't without its risk. Like any other asset class. These events have also highlighted that Retail debt investors don't appreciate the risks and also use debt instruments the right way in a portfolio. Make no mistake, fixed income instruments play a vital role in a portfolio provided that they are used correctly. Today we'll start with the absolute basics. Today we have with us Amrita Mohanty of Franklin Templeton, Assistant Vice President of FT Academy. Amrita has over 16 years of experience in the financial services industry. Amrita has been driving the Franklin Templeton Academy for over the last four years, dedicating herself to the field of learning and development. She empowers distribution partners to understand varied investment concepts and skills with greater clarity and conviction. She has facilitated over 1,000 training programs and has trained around 10,000 distributors and clients across the country. Her key specializations are in the domain of conceptualizing tailor-made products and effective delivery content, instructional designing, interactive training management, and e-learning management systems. She has conceptualized the uh, and executed programs in the area of practice management, macroeconomics, behavioral economics, financial markets, and has authored over 200 micro learning articles de-jargonizing concepts. Prior to Franklin Templeton Academy, she managed sales driving key channel partner relationships and clients in South India for investment related products. Amrita holds a management degree in and PSP charter. We also have with us Swaroop from Franklin Templeton. Amrita will be taking over now. Over to you Amrita. Uh, thank you so much, Mohit, and thank you so much, Zerodha, for giving Franklin Templeton uh, an opportunity, a glorious opportunity to address your clients and your partners on understanding key nuances and key aspects of fixed income investing. Yes, um, uh, under Franklin Templeton, under the banner of Franklin Templeton, we have the Learning and Development uh, Amrita, Academy. Amrita, sorry to uh, disturb. So if the yeah. video is playing there anywhere near your surrounding, just can you just put it on pause? Uh, there's, okay, so there, yeah, I will do that. Is that fine now? Yeah, fine, fine. Continue, please. Yeah. So uh, uh, Franklin Templeton Academy is the learning and development channel for Franklin Templeton Investments, where we offer structured wo workshops and programs that touch upon different aspects of investment uh, advisory business and about financial markets. So this is, as we all know, is a broadcast or a webinar. Uh, we need to make it very interactive. And this reminds me of this famous quote by Benjamin Franklin, which goes like this that tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. So how are we going to make this broadcast very interesting is the entire program is interspersed with knowledge checks and I would request all our participants to heartily participate and give their views and thoughts around the questions being asked. So the first trivia question is, what do you think is the total share of gross financial savings to household savings in India? And your options are, is it around 40%? Is it around 49%? Is it around 10%? Uh, or is it around 35%? So I'll pause for a few seconds till we get uh, participation for this trivia before proceeding to the answer. Thank you so much. So the total share of Household uh, total share of financial savings to total household savings to India is around 49%. But it wasn't the case five, six years before or six, seven years before. It was around 40%. 
but an event called the Currency Replacement Program that took place in November 2016 actually changed the landscape. It actually led to formalization of economy and the share of gross financial savings moving up. Now, reforms in the format of Jam Trinity, currency replacement program, tax compliance, all has led to a big appetite amongst investors towards financial savings and financial instruments. So look at this data. So the total number of tax filers two, three years before were roughly around 4.63 crores, and that itself has moved up to 6.86 crores. Not only that, the total number of taxpayers, which includes companies, firms, etc., having an income of above, above, above one crore has risen to about 60%. Now, what does what does all these maze of data indicate is that uh, the entire gamut of financial products are seeing appetite? Not only that, the industry of mutual funds has uh, has seen a promising rise and increase. So if I have to ask another question in the sense that what do you think is the proportion of debt mutual funds of fixed income mutual funds as a percentage to FDAUM, what do you think is that number? Do you think is it around 25%? Is it around 11%? Or is it around 5%? Or is it around 35%? I'll take a pause for a while before we get inputs from our participants. All right, thank you so much. The proportion of fixed income mutual funds or debt mutual funds as a percentage to FDAUM is just around 11%. Now, this is the landscape of India. Here are the different states with their bank FD base. And then we have what is the debt mutual fund AUM in all of these states. And as you can see, the penetration is low, ranges from as low as 0.8% to as high as 25%. Say for a state like Maharashtra, which has an FD base of 24 lakh crores, but an MF base of 5.89 lakh crores. Now, why are we discussing all of that is that mutual fund as a percentage to GDP in India is miles to go. We have 134 crore Indians, but less than 1.5% of Indians are investing in India. Look at the data and compare it with advanced economies like USA and Canada and France. The mutual fund penetration as and as compared to a percentage of GDP is way higher. So look at this data. We've got around 13 odd, 13 odd lakh crores into total debt mutual fund schemes. Compare it with state-wise, uh, uh, you know, the FD base in India, it's just around 11%, which means financialization of assets has begun. Formalization of economy is taking place. And then we have this industry, which has grown at a CAGR of 25% roughly for the past five years but it leads it needs a lot more awareness so typically fixed income or fixed income mutual funds are known to be enigma when i mention enigma we refer to them as mystery while people understand the risk return characteristics of equity people come with that expectations that there will be volatility there would be a propensity to lose money as much as there are opportunities to make money but the nuances of fixed income fixed income instruments and a means which is fixed income mutual funds barely gets understand understood so the objective of today's broadcast ladies and gentlemen is to demystify you know, the concepts around fixed income instruments and funds with far greater clarity and conviction. So what is it that from Franklin Templeton we are going to cover? We'll start right from basics. We'll understand what do we mean by a bond contract? What are the key characteristics of a bond? How do we differentiate between current yield and YTM? Do we understand the concept of yield? What are the different types of bonds available? What are the different types of bond funds available considering the fact that SEBI has, has laid out in its circular pertaining to categorization of mutual fund schemes? There are 16 odd categories. So we should understand what are those 16 different categories.
There are risks. So Warren Buffett's iconic statement is risk comes from not knowing what you are doing. There is a risk. There is also a risk not investing into products. So risk comes from not knowing what you are doing. So we will look at demystifying credit risk and interest rate risk. We will understand the concept of duration and how different is Macaulay duration from modified duration and certain aspects that needs to be taken care of while selecting a debt fund. And we'll end this broadcast, uh, uh, you know, discussing about the taxations of debt mutual funds. So what is debt? So debt is an investment option that gives an investor two things, protection of capital and assurance of fixed income. So there is a cash flow in the format of coupon and the principal amount gets returned back at the time of maturity. So debt is a loan contract. The DNA remains the same be it for a basic in debt instrument or something as complicated or complex as a, a pass-through certificate or a mortgage-backed security, the DNA essentially is there is an issuer. Who is an issuer in a loan contract, which is known as the debt, which is a root of capital markets, which enables companies to raise funds to expand their businesses. So there is an issuer who needs to raise funds. He's the borrower of funds. There is an investor who's, an, who's a lender to the issuer and an investor into this loan contract or debt instrument. There is a promise in this legal contract that... The principal amount, the capital that has been invested will be returned back on the day this contract matures, which is known as the maturity date. And money has time value. What is worth 100 bucks today is not going to be worth 100 bucks one year down the line because there is an impact of inflation. Therefore, there is an issuer's cost of raising money as much as an investor's risk of giving money. And that risk gets compensated by paying interest, which could come in different frequencies. An interest could be quarterly, half yearly, yearly, or no interest at all. Let's look at the case of a zero coupon bond, for example. So there is a promise to pay coupon or interest. So what are the key terms? Before dwelling into the key terms, again, a quick trivia, and I would encourage an active participation from all our, all our esteemed participants. What do you think is the maturity of a 20-year bond, which was issued on 1st Jan 2003, as on 1st Jan 2019? So bond was issued in 2003. What do you think is the maturity of that bond in 2019? Is it four years? Is it, is it 20 years? Is it 14 years? Or is it 16 years? So I will pause for a few seconds and I would request and urge all of you to wholeheartedly participate using the chat way, pane before I proceed to the next slide or divulge the answer. Thank you so much for your lovely responses. Yes, if a bond was issued in 2003 and has a maturity of 20 years, 2003 plus 20, the bond is maturing in 2023. So 2023 minus today's date or current year of 2019 gives us a leftover or residual maturity of four years. So let's understand the anatomy of a bond, looking at an example of a paper bond. We all know that bond, bonds are now issued in an electronic format, but just to demystify it, looking or considering a basic example, here are the key features of a bond. It has to have a maturity date. In this case, the bond matures in November 1987, which is 15th November 1987. There is an issuer, and an issuer is, is an entity that issues a loan contract or issues a bond. It could be government, state government, corporates, private sector enterprises, so on and so forth. So in this case, the issuer is the Commonwealth of Wealth of Australia. I was mentioning about time value of concept, time value of money concept and coupon helps preserve time value of money. So the coupon rate in this case is five quarter percent and par value is the reference amount taken to calculate coupon amount or coupon rate. For example, if the bond has a par value of 
$20 and the coupon rate is 5.25%, which means the coupon amount is 5.25% multiplied by 20. It works out to be 1.04 or 1.05 uh, is the amount. So what is the par value? It is not just the reference amount to compute coupon. It's the principal amount that gets returned back once the bond matures. So those are the, the, the key terminologies. It's important to understand it. For a lot of you, it could be brush up. But yes, bond is a tradable loan, loan contract. The issuer could be a government, could be state government, could be corporates. There is an investor. There is a par value. There is a coupon. And maturity is the length of the loan. Now, bonds can be bought and sold on an exchange. They could be liquid. They could be traded. So they, they are tradable loan contracts. And since they are traded, there is, there is a price movement. And the price may change on a daily basis in response to interest rates, the prevailing interest rates in the market. For example, if interest rates have to move up and the bond pays a low coupon, it will have a negative bearing in the prices of the bond. The bond prices could change in relation to the issuer's credit rating. If there is an upgrade, it is perceived that the bond is stronger. It has the ability to repay its uh, obligations, and that has a positive impact on the bond prices. The overall bond market conditions, because there are numerous bonds and there are numerous buyers. The buyers could be retailers. The buyers could be uh, institutions, the buyers could be foreign portfolio investors, the buyers could be banks, could be insurance companies, could be mutual funds. So if there is a lot of sale, it definitely or redemptions or sales, it definitely affects the prices of bonds. So what are the different types of fixed income instruments? Broadly, we demarcate fixed income instruments into two types. Basis their maturity. Now, the bonds or the fixed income instruments which have a maturity of equal to or more than a year are called bonds or debentures. And those instruments which have a maturity of less than a year are called money market instruments. For example, there are numerous money market instruments which you could find in the portfolios of liquid funds, overnight funds, short duration funds, uh, low duration funds, etc. So what are those money market instruments? And money market instruments are fixed income instruments which have a maturity of less than a year. We could have commercial papers where the issuer is corporates. We could have certificate of deposits where the issuer are banks. And then we have uh, the government of India, which issues treasury bills. And the maturities could be 91 days, 182 days, 364 days, et cetera. So government issues treasury bills and government securities because it has a government borrowing program. And the reason the government has a government borrowing program is that it is an elected entity. There are expenditures to be made. So when the expenditure is more than the receipts, there is a fiscal deficit. So primarily, Treasury bills and GSECs are ways and means used by the government to fund the fiscal deficit. And all you can see right now is be it commercial paper, be it certificate of deposits, or be it treasury bills, the maturity does not exceed a year. So they start with as low as a seven day maturity, exceeding to uh, 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 going to maximum a year of maturity. So what is a call money? A call money is interbank borrowing, borrowing or lending between two banks for a tenure of one day to 14 days. And what is a CBLO? So earlier it was called before November 2018. CBLO was, uh, which is called collateralized borrowing and lending obligation. Uh, 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 the, the name has changed. It's no longer called CBLO. It has got discontinued. It's called TREPS, which is tri-party repo, which was introduced in um, on 5th November 2018. So if you are, if you have to understand TREP, we should understand what is a repo. So what is a repo? It's it's a borrowing that that. Uh, banks use to borrow funds from the Reserve Bank of India. So it is an instrument which is utilized by banks to borrow money from Reserve Bank of India. And the way it is done is by selling a security with an agreement to buy back that security after a certain period of time. 
Now, if that transaction involves a third party and involves a collateral, it becomes a TREP. So TREP is a tri-party repo where an investor would place the money now with a third party, which is called a custodian bank, which in turn will lend it to another institution and the assets are pledged or collateralized and the securities that are used for pledging or collateralization are primarily GSEX, T-bills, it could be uh, corporate bonds, it also could be commercial papers. So here is uh, the most popular format of money market instruments. I've taken this data from CI, CC CIL economic research. In fact, TREPs uh, are transacted primarily through the CCIL platform. And you could see that there is a lot of uh, volumes of money market transaction that happens. TREPs uh, average volume for the for, on a quarter on quarter basis is around 1, 1.45, 1.47 uh, lakh crores anywhere between 1 lakh crore to 1.47 lakh crores it's quite uh, you know uh, the volumes are quite good followed by call etc so money market is is important it is required by by different players of uh, fixed income market markets to take care of their money uh, to take care of their working capital requirements and and there are different types of fixed income funds available which utilize money market instruments in their portfolios so for example here we have this is a fact sheet that i've taken from franklin templeton here we have a money market fund and you could see all these names and if you go deeper into them they are mostly a cp mostly a cd so you could see that 97 percent of the portfolio is primarily into money market instruments and the ratings like a1 a1 plus etc are ratings given by credit rating agencies which are synonymous for short-term ratings so a portfolio like this or similar with other amcs would have a lot of cp cds treasury bills etc and treps earlier called cblos so we talked about money market instruments let's move on to bonds now bonds uh, just to reiterate are fixed income securities which have a maturity of more than a year and they could be classified basis coupon so we could have fixed interest bonds bonds that pay regular uh, coupon at periodic intervals we could have floaters where the coupon amount changes with reference to uh, uh, a certain reference rate that has been taken to calculate the coupon amount. Or as, as I had mentioned before, the bonds may not pay coupon at, at all. They might pay accumulated coupon at the end of the maturity of the bond. So one could have fixed interest bonds, one could have floating rate bonds, one could also have zero coupon bonds. And basis issuers, we could have government securities, state government securities, PSU bonds, and corporate bonds. So let's do, let's conduct a quick knowledge check once again. I would request all our esteemed participants to use the chat pane. Here I have on the left-hand side of your screen, different types of bonds, and then on the right-hand side of the screen, different definitions. So what do you think is the correct definition of a zero coupon bond? What do you think is the correct definition of fixed interest? Uh, interest bonds what do you think is the correct definition of floating rate bonds so you could mention uh, you know uh, you utilizing the chat pane i'll take a pause for a few minutes a few seconds before we divulge the answers All right. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, zero coupon bonds are bonds that pay no coupons. They're mostly issued at a discount to the face value and redeemed at the face value. Uh, fixed interest bonds are bonds with fixed interest or coupon, which is um, a predetermined interest uh, at, the, at the time of subscription of the bond. And then floaters, as the name mentioned, do not have a fixed coupon. The coupon gets reset at pre-announced intervals.
So there are other types of bonds. One could have convertible bonds, uh, which gives an option to convert the bonds partially or fully into equity shares. We could have pa pass-through certificates in the format of mortgage-backed securities or asset-backed securities. It is securitizing a cash flow. So there could be a bank which is which has a big book, say, of home loans, and those could be securitized and transformed into uh, a fixed income instrument, and those are known as pass-through certificates. Now, way back in 2013, we had inflations at very high levels. So there was CPI and WPI languishing at 10% odd levels. And those time, there were talks around inflation-linked bonds. How about having the coupon linked to CPI? So CPI plus certain spread will be the coupon paid on inflation-linked bonds. So it is like a floating rate bond, except for the fact that the base uh, 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 entity taken to calculate the coupon is CPI, whereas for floating rates, it could be MIBOR, it could be the, the cutoff uh, yield of a 365-day treasury bill or 182-day tre treasury bill, etc. And then you could have perpetual bonds, as the name mentions, bonds without a maturity. So bonds without a maturity, which is that an issuer has the option to buy back the bond after a specific period. So there is a call option, and uh, it's typically for a period of five years after the date of issue. And these perpetual bonds are listed on the stock exchange and usually issued by manufacturing companies and banks. So here we have discussed about uh, fixed income being a loan contract, having an issuer and a borrower, coupon, maturity, par value are the key features. And you could have money market uh, instruments and bonds, bonds of different types. When we are talking about bonds and the types of bonds, very important to understand the concept of yield. Now, even coupon is an yield, but it is called as the nominal yield. Now, when a bond is is issued fresh, which is it's a fresh bond or a new bond issue. Obviously, the bond is issued at a par value and it gives a certain coupon amount. So coupon amount divided by the par value gives you the nominal yield or the coupon rate. For example, what if the bond had a par value Uh, we'll try to bring Amta back online as soon as possible. I think there was some technical difficulty at her end. The audio was also breaking off. It might take a few moments.
I don't know. I, I'm, I'm just quickly sharing my screen. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, welcome back, Amrita. Yeah. So uh, am I clear now? Is it audible? Yeah, it's audible. Uh, is there's, the... yeah, there's nothing yeah. on the screen. Yeah, the screen was visible just for yeah. a moment. Now? Can I proceed? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, yes. so, the screen yeah. keeps disappearing. Yeah. Yeah. Is it fine now? Yeah, it's fine. No, no it's gone again. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Now. So can I start? Please, please. Yeah. So, uh, so I will start from where I had left off. Uh, so we were uh, talking about what is uh, the relationship between coupon and yield. So when we are talking about yield, uh, when we are talking about coupon, it's called the nominal yield, which is coupon amount divided by the par value. For example, if uh, an investor buys the bond at par value of 100 bucks, has a coupon of 100 rupees, 10 rupees, 10 divided by 100 is the coupon rate, which is called the nominal yield. It's called the nominal yield because it's calculated basis par value. But what if you have to buy this bond from secondary market and there is a price incident to this bond? It's no longer available at 100 rupees. Assume it is available at 90 rupees. In that case, 10 divided by 90, 11.11 is this is the yield. So what is the yield? Yield is the expected rate of return from a debt instrument. It is the annualized rate of return that can be expected from a debt instrument. And it has two qualifiers. It could be called the current yield or yield to maturity. For example, current yield estimates a bond yield for a single current year. So as we have seen, it's a secondary market terminology where you're not buying the bond from a primary ecosystem. You're buying the bond from a secondary ecosystem. So there is a coupon amount. There is a price. Coupon amount divided by price is called the current yield, which is if you have to hold the bond for a single current year, what's the estimated return one, we, one can get from an instrument? Now, if you can see the uh, formula of current yield, it is ignoring certain factors. What if the bond had a maturity of four years? What if you held on to the bond for four years, which is its maturity period, despite of not buying this particular instrument from the primary market, you intend to hold it for the maturity period. That means the maturity period and par value are not being taken into consideration. That's where YTM comes into picture, which is far more accurate. It tells us the anticipated return from and bond instrument if the bond is held till maturity, and even if it has not been bought from a secondary market ecosystem. So the formula for YTM is square root of face value by N divided by current price minus one, where face value is the maturity amount that is returned back to the investor. Price is the current price of the bond. Current price of the bond is the price of the bond minus one. Now, how do we explain this in a better format? Let's look at an example. Imagine there is, there is a fixed income instrument which has a face value of 1,000 bucks. It's got a 10% annual coupon. It's redeemable at par after four years and currently priced at 980 rupees. If we just had to calculate current yield, which is the anticipated return from this instrument, if we just hold it for a single current year, we just require two variables. One is we need to find out what is the coupon amount, which is simple. 10% of 1,000, which is equivalent to 100, is the coupon amount. We just need coupon amount. We need the current market price. So 100 divided by 980 gives us 10.204% or 10.2%. That's the the current yield. As you can see, current yield is not taking other variables like maturity period and the face value returned back. And that's where 
rate comes into the picture so if you if you if you find this formula to be too tedious excel has made our life very easy all we have to do is open an excel sheet um, uh, go to formulas pick up rate it opens a window and plug in all the variables for example n per stands for maturity period which is in this case is 4 years pmt is the is is the is the cash flow received and here we get a cash flow which is a coupon that is Hundred rupees um, uh, per year. PV is the uh, the present value of the investment, and PV is the amount that we have invested, which is in this case is nine eighty. Now Excel says that whenever there is an outflow, there has to be a minus sign prefixed before the value. So we are investing nine eighty bucks, but a minus sign is is embedded into the function argument box and when we buy a bond at 980 which gives us 1000 rupees in as coupon we hold on to this bond for 4 years when the bond matures we get a face value which is 1000 rupees that means plugging all these variables together we get the ytm as 10.64% so you will get a formula result like this convert it into percentage it comes out to be 10.64 so whenever there is a bond that is trading at a discount to its face value yield and ytm will be higher than the coupon whenever there is a bond that is trading at a premium to its face value then coupon will be higher than the yield and the ytm so ytm is nothing but the rate of return we can expect from a bond instrument provided that even if we have bought it from a secondary ecosystem or market we hold the bond till maturity so it is called the discount rate if you knew the ytm of a debt product and you want to find out or a debt instrument or a debt security and you want to know what is the apt price for it so this is the rate which will discount all the future payments all the future coupon and the principal amount to its present value and that will reflect the price of the bond for example we will use the present value function so what if you knew the ytm of a, you knew the yield of a debt security you also know that you will get 100 rupees coupon the first year 100 rupees coupon the second year 100 rupees coupon the third year and on the fourth year when the bond matures you get the final coupon and the face value or the par value of the bond back so 100 plus 100 plus 100 plus 1100 what if you already were aware of the yield or ytm and you wanted to know what is the apt price for this bond so what you have to do is you just need to find the present value which is nothing but coupon divided by 1 plus ytm to the power 1 plus coupon 2 divided by 1 plus ytm to the power 2 plus coupon end to the 1 plus ytm to the power n plus face value divided by 1 plus ytm to the power n when you plug in all these values you get the present value for example if i have so if i am i am to receive 100 rupees one year down the line at a discount rate of 10.64 the value of that 100 rupees one year down the line will be worth 90.38 rupees today similarly the 100 rupees that i will get three years down the line if i have to get that amount today it will be worth 73.84 rupees today and I'm supposed to receive 100 plus 1000 rupees, which is 1100 rupees four years down the line. If I want that entire chunk of money today at a discount rate of 10.64%, it will be worth 734.08. Same is the case for the cash flow, which will come two years down the line. If I want it today, it will be worth 81.69. When I add all these numbers the 90 90.38 of the world 81.61 of the world 69 of the world plus 73.84 plus 734 i get the value 980 which was precisely what was asked that means ytm is that if i if i have to so it's like a discounted cash flow all of you who are aware of equity and valuation of equity it's like your discounted cash flow what if i need all the cash flow today what is the price I need to pay? 
Now, there could be a price mismatch. This 980 rupees may not be the actual price quoted. But if this is the intrinsic value of the bond, and if you find that the bond is not quoting to its intrinsic value, it becomes a value investing in terms of an attractive buying opportunity to buy the bond from a secondary market at atmosphere. So just to re uh, reiterate, beat yield or YTM for the benefit of the larger audience is even coupon is the rate of return. The only thing about coupon is the rate of return in a primary market and yield and YTM is the rate of return expected from a fixed income security from a secondary market. Why fixed income is necessary? So uh, it's important that fixed income is required because look at every asset class, be it equity, be it debt, be it gold. Every asset class has its unique risk return characteristics. For example, the biggest driver for equity is in the long run taking the quote of Warren Buffett that stock markets are slaves to earnings in the long run. So equity markets does well in a buoyant economic climate when the GDP growth rate is great, the business cycles have improved, the companies are making profits. When does a debt asset class uh, functions well or performs well is when the prevailing interest rates are low, that gives capital appreciation, to those investors who buy bonds from secondary markets or to fund managers who are managing duration centric products. Even when a bond gets upgraded, that also is positive for the debt, uh, debt asset class or for the debt market. Now, every asset class has divergent risk return characteristics. Gold is considered to be a hedge against economic uncertainty. It's considered to be a hedge against inflation. If you look at the last 20 years data, whatever has been the uh, CPI rate of growth of consumer price inflation, which is around 7%, would be roughly around the rate of growth, or growth for gold. Now, why am I talking this is that every asset class has different drivers, different functions, and therefore different risk return characteristics. Now, equity is a high risk, high reward. It's a compounding game. It's a wealth multiplication game. Recently, Sensex turned into a 40-year-old, and it's given a 16% CAGR. That's phenomenal wealth creation. But when we compare the returns in context of volatility, which is and one of the measures of volatility is standard deviation and what is standard deviation it is dispersion of returns from its mean it's like a pendulum so for i use the analogy of pendulum to define standard deviation for example the returns of, of just like a pendulum could move right come back to its mean move left come back to its mean what is the swings of returns and it seems that for this period which i have taken from 2002 to April 2009, it comes with a 27% standard deviation, which means for people in a bull market, it's a rewarding asset class. But for investors who've just invested and the bulls changes its color and the animalistic tend tendencies to bear, it it can erode wealth and it leads to a lot of psychological impact. So equity has to be for people who have that psychological makeup and ability to go for long term and understand this asset class well. So it comes with high standard deviation. But when we looked at Crystal Composite Bond Fund Index, the standard deviation is barely 4%. You look at gold and, and traded gold, it also comes with very high measures of volatility. Now, now, each of these asset classes and many, many more have their own return and their own volatility features. And therefore, why we require fixed income or debt in the portfolio of client is in the parlance of wealth management. A hundred percent debt is also called a risky portfolio. As much as a hundred percent equity is also called an, uh, a high risk portfolio.
now 100% equity is not meant for everyone you know it's only meant for people who have the psychological ability the risk appetite to fathom the you know the volatility associated with it so ask any behavioral scientists or behavioral economists like say for example daniel kahneman and if you if you hear his interviews he will say that you know one of the most important reason uh, you know one of the most important questions we should ask investors is how much loss can you take do you have the appetite to take loss you will never see only bull 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 markets throughout there will be cycles bull bear and bull it will be rewarding in the long run do you have the psychological ability to take Uh, you know volatility when the markets are tumultuous and therefore there are behavioral biases that has come into pictures like loss aversion mental accounting etc so therefore because people are more emotional more psychological in their investment decision making debt is required because it cuts down the standard deviation so left to their own individual asset class one struggles against inflation the other has too much of volatility but an apt mix of these two asset classes actually optimizes returns and cuts down risk so the idea is not to get the best return the idea is to get optimum returns which can beat inflation which can preserve or empower purchasing power but also can get the swing or the volatility uh, uh reduced to a major ex- extent so that's the reason why fixed income is required in our portfolios so what are debt funds so debt if you look at mutual funds it is a mean to invest into asset classes so equity fund is a medium to invest into equity asset class so is a debt fund it's a medium to invest into asset into debt asset classes why we started with basics is that there are 16 categories of debt funds so debt fund is a portfolio that invests in debt instruments so broadly you could categorize debt funds as funds where the driver of return is coupon and funds where the driver of returns could be coupon plus something else so broadly if you look at returns in a debt fund it could come because of price it could come because coupon is getting accrued and that is why it is called income return what is a price return now interest rates and price are inversely correlated to each other if i have to go back to the previous example you can see from this formula is that price is inversely related to yield yield and interest rates are directly related to each other now if interest rate has to move up prices are fluctuating now or interest rates have to move down prices yields goes down and price there is a capital appreciation so what is a duration strategy is it looks at the relationship between yield and interest rates and tries to capitalize on it then there could be spread return for example there is a spread between a double a rated corporate bond over uh, a gsec bond for a similar tenure say for example the spread is 150 basis point you know the spread is high because the environment can be negative now once the environment improves it could be on account of macroeconomic improvement there is better gdp growth better iip growth uh, you know there are good job creations there could be good macro trends it could be general buoyancy in the debt markets the spread can contract and that spread contraction also generates return for a debt fund and what is a calendar return is that a, a, an investor who has bought a bond from secondary market he has invested with the intent to held, hold the bond till maturity but then if if interest rates have fallen few years down the line the natural passage of time that gives rise to alpha opportunity is called calendar returns that means the driver of the debt fund nav can be interest can be various other reasons it is basically elongating maturity or reducing maturity to capitalize on interest rate and price relationship it could be because the spreads have contracted it could be because the general passage of time which is also so called riding on the yield curve or calendar return drives the nav 
So what is accrual fund? As per SEBI's classification, accrual funds are funds where the Macaulay duration, it's an interesting concept, we will explain it as we proceed further, are debt mutual funds which could buy one day Macaulay duration, duration of one day to maximum three years. Now, NAV moves and because of the NAV movement, gener returns are generated. Now, in accrual funds, the prime driver or the or the force that pushes up the NAV is accrued interest. It is coupon and income return that pushes the NAV. The price return there is contribution, but it is minimal. So it could be for a for an overnight fund, uh, which uh, which maintains a Macaulay duration of one year. The prime driver of NAV is accrued interest. But for a short-term income plan, the prime driver, there could be 80% movement of NAV on account of income, but there could be some price return as well. But all in all, if you're talking about accrual fund, one of the prime drivers is income return more than the prime uh, price returns. When we talk about duration fund, it is basically studying yield curve. Did you know that yield curve is an economic indicator? It is the relationship between yield and maturity of uh, instruments having the same credit quality. It basically tells whether there will be an ex expansion or a recession or it's it's in a what you call a Goldilocks economy, neither expansion, neither recession. It's like a status quo phase. So duration funds typically study a lot of macroeconomic trends and then try to adjust the duration of the product so that there could be capital appreciation. So price returns, the duration, the calendar are the prime drivers. Income may not be a major component. And most of the duration centric funds come with a Macaulay duration of over three years. So just to explain to the benefit of the larger audience, we could have duration funds, we could have accrual funds. And accrual funds returns are dependent upon the coupon receipts. They are less dependent upon macroeconomic events or factors. They are all weather solutions. So uh, you could have some sort of a credit risk or interest rate ri uh, or, or liquidity risk, but the robust, if the fund management process is robust, there are covenants involved, there are good structures involved, a lot of risks get mitigated. So they are all weather solution returns hovers around the yield. When we talk about duration funds, we are basically talking about returns generated by capital appreciation and plays on interest rate movements. They're dependent on macroeconomic events and it is meant for tactical allocation. So if you look at the way SEBI has categorized funds, they have broadly categorized funds based on three broad buckets. One is duration based, one is rating based, one is objective based. So, uh, you know, if, if products have one day of duration, they could be called uh, overnight fund. If their duration or Macaulay duration is one day to three months, they are called liquid funds. Therefore, you have different categories. So from a liquid to a short duration are primarily funds where the underlying coupon income drives the NAV. Now, again from short duration funds till long duration funds are funds where the prime driver of NAV or the return generation is because there are tactical calls taken. One could have classification of funds basis credit risk. For example, higher rated AA plus and above funds are called corporate bond funds. AA and below are called credit risk funds. And you could have objectives like banking and PSU, which will invest only in banking and PSU securities. GILT, which will on, only invest in GSEC securities, government of India, government securities. You could have a bullet portfolio where you know, you're only buying GILT, but the duration has to be 10 years. And then there could be floaters. We explain floaters where the interest rate is not fixed. It is linked to a reference rate that could be a MIBOR, that could be that could be a cutoff 365 days treasury bill yield, and it changes when the reference rate changes. So these are the broad 16 categories. And if you have to create an efficient frontier, what is an efficient frontier? How do they fare? You know, how do they fare in terms of returns and risk? The lowest risk and thereby the lowest also not giving humongous opportunity to generate returns are, uh, you know, uh, 
overnight liquid money market and longer the duration and then uh, uh, you know investments into sub triple a papers the risk moves up but it doesn't mean that we shun these products out as we were discussing about equity fixed income and gold every product has their risk return characteristics if we understand them the problem is not about positioning the the problem is not with the funds the problem is whether they are getting positioned to the right investor for example duration funds and that do a gilt fund it is investing into sovereign securities gsec securities are considered to be sovereign which means that there is not an iota of credit risk but they are highly sensitive because gsec is a dominant security in the fixed income market so uh, even if it has less credit risk there is a huge interest rate sensitivity now if this product is given to a retiree who is dependent on uh, a systematic withdrawal or cash flows or annuity emanating out of a gilt fund that's not the best strategy so very important is that you must understand the broad objectives and basis that understand what is our time frame what is our goal what is our risk profile first step is asset allocation and then products and within products important to understand what do they stand for so moving on uh as i have mentioned before if for a for a period of 4 5 uh, for a period of 10 15 years the standard deviation is usually less which means that they are less volatile uh, past returns may not be a future indicator but there is some predictability around returns what is important for a debt fund is to first look at the yield what is the ytm of the fund as i have mentioned before ytm indicates the expected return from a debt fund we have to deduct the expense ratio and find out what is the net yield now depending upon the objective of the fund they it could give lot of capital appreciation or may not give capital appreciation it may give a return around ytm so that will lead to a value change so one of the most important driver for a debt fund is please look at the yield it is an important starting point uh, so in with that thought in uh, in mind let us look at conducting a quick trivia imagine you have a smart income fund and a great income fund they have identical objectives which is what i have highlighted here they are managed in a similar style by their respective fund managers smart income fund currently has a ytm of 8.5% expense ratio of 1.6% great income fund has a ytm of 8.25% expense ratio of 1% if you have this information yes i'm not sharing a lot of information there are other aspects to it also based on this information which Which fund do you think will is expected to deliver better returns? You could use the chat pane, uh, and I would request active participation from all our esteemed uh, participants who have taken time off to attend this broadcast. What do you think? Which fund will deliver a better return? So I'll take a pause for a few seconds before I uh, publish the answer. I'll take uh, you know a couple of minutes pause, couple of seconds pause. thank you so much for your responses if there are these two funds which have identical objective similar way of portfolio management style and and just considering their yield and the expense ratio all we have to do is deduct the expense ratio from the yield and an yield without taking the impact of expense ratio is known as the gross yield so when we deduct 8.5 when we deduct 1.6% expense ratio from 8.5 uh we get an answer which is um, 6.9 and when we subtract 1% from 8.25 we get an answer which is 7.25 so the correct answer is great income fund so here the caveat is if there are two funds with identical objectives managed in a similar fashion yield becomes a good starting point because it tells you the expected return expected from a debt fund
Now, there are risks involved. And Warren Buffett's iconic statement is risk comes from not knowing what you are doing. So it's, it's little knowledge which is dangerous. So it's very important to understand what could be the risks uh, in debt funds and in debt instruments. So there could be risks like credit risk, interest rate risk, liquidity risk, inflation risk, interest rates have fallen, so the bond has been called. So there could be a prepayment risk. You've invested into an FMP that gave a 10% yield. Now the current prevailing yields are on the lower side. There could be a reinvestment risk. But primarily, it's very important to understand credit interest and to some extent, liquidity risk. So what is meant by credit risk is credit risk is the risk of default. It's the risk of non-payment of principal and interest uh, amount. And credit risk is measured by CRAs. They are known as the credit rating agency. Always remember it is an opinion. An opinion can change. And the way they assess credit risk in debt instruments is there is an assessment of willingness, which is an index of management risk, which is how, you know, uh, uh, ethical, strong the management is, what is their intent, what is the track records. So willingness means understanding management risk. Ability is the ability of the issuer to return back the money. So obviously it has to do with balance sheet, financial risk, business risk, the ability to return back the uh, uh, the, uh, the obligation. So it's the cash generation capacity to meet financial obligation. So it is issue specific. So if there is an issue, it is given a particular rating, the same issuer for another bond, the rating may not be identical. And the credit rating agencies uh, definitely, uh, uh, you know, put in a surveillance mechanism to look at the rating throughout the length of the bond or to, uh, throughout the maturity period of the bond. So there are different CRAs in India, Crystal being one of them. It's called the Credit Rating Information Services of India. We have ICRA, we've got CARE, Brickworks, India Ratings, Mera, etc. So the way the rating scale works is that we have a long-term uh, rating scale and we have a short-term rating scale. So obviously long-term rating scales are for those instruments whose maturity is more than a year. Short-term instruments is for those uh, short-term rating scale are for those instruments where the maturity is less than a year. So uh, a rating which is below triple B, if it is below triple B, if it is double B, for instance, are called sub-investment grade. So we are not permitted to invest into securities on the long-term scale or neither on the short-term scale uh, uh, ratings, which are uh, double B, B, C, D, or A4, D. They are all called uh, sub-investment grade uh, papers. Uh, we are permissible to buy instruments which have a rating of triple B and above and A three and above. So the moment the nomenclature changes from triple B to A to double A to triple A, it indicates that the safety angle associated with the bond improves, which means the ability of the issuer to pay back uh, the bond cash flows is far better. So there could be plus and minus signs uh, in between. For example, it starts with double B, double B plus or double B minus, A plus, A, A, a minus, A, A plus, similarly, double A minus, double A, double A plus. So uh, the rating scales for other rating agencies is not much different. It is almost the same, except that if it is a CARE, it would be mentioned as CARE triple A. If it is Crystal, it would be mentioned as Crystal triple A. Now, uh, this is the rating scale and uh, bonds are rated and it's always better to buy bonds with higher safety. But having said that, uh, if uh, Crystal publishes a rating scale, um, uh, if the time permits, I'll share that scale with you, is that uh, the, stabil the stability of ratings are very good in the sense that whichever uh, issues have been assigned even double A or A, there is a 90 plus percent probability that the rating gets retained one year down the line. That means the transition of the ratings are quite stable. Uh, so even if there is, uh, you know, there is a lot of negative news in the market, uh, there are a lot of papers where the ratings are, um, there are around 18 or 20,000, uh, 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 you know, 
issues that has been rated and mutual funds have barely invested in 500 of them so there is a huge scope to research and find out good rated papers and at this juncture uh, when there is too much of noise the perception of risk is far higher than the actual risk it's actually a good time to invest because uh, again taking cue from sir john templeton buy when everybody sells sells when everybody buys so when there is too much of negativity that's the time when the perception of risk is higher than the actual risk then there is something called the interest rate risk and i was mentioning that that interest rates and bond prices are inversely correlated to each other for example imagine there is a bond that pays 8% coupon one year down the line there is a fresh bond that is issued which pays 9% coupon so you have two options if you have fresh money invest into the new bond if you do not have fresh money you have to relinquish your existing bond but the question is is it that easy to relinquish your existing bond your existing bond apparently pays a lower coupon and there may not be many buyers for your bond which means that until and unless there is a discount to the price of your bond if you are giving a discount of to the face value then there are takers so basically when interest rate moves up bond prices fall down now bond prices sensitivity to interest rate differs from bonds uh, uh having different maturity different coupon payments different frequency of coupon payments now especially interest rate risk impacts bonds that are traded now the impact of uh, the interest rate on the price of a bond or any view of a bond is measured by a formula called duration now duration has different avatars you could have a macaulay duration there could be a modified duration there could be a key rate duration now when we are talking about duration we are speaking about macaulay duration it is a misnomer and a misunderstanding to interpret duration to be equivalent to maturity maturity is a key component in the formula of duration but maturity is not equivalent to duration maturity is when the principal amount is paid so what exactly is duration it starts with macaulay duration and it's similar to the whiteium concept which we spoke few uh, you know few slides before so what is macaulay duration is that imagine you need the entire cash flow today imagine you have invested in a bond that gives 100 rupees coupon one year down the line 100 rupees coupon two years down the line 100 rupees coupon three years down the line so on and so forth and you get your final amount the principal amount back on the fourth year now what if you needed all your principal and coupon amount today what is the weighted average time required so weighted average time to full recovery of your principal and interest payment of a bond which is weighted average maturity of cash flows weighted average number of years to receive the bond's future cash flow today is called macaulay duration which means it's like starting a business what if you have started a business you've invested a certain amount there are certain expenditures involved what is that time where you will break even so the time to break even for an investor who has invested into a fixed income security or a portfolio that has fixed income securities is called the break even time is called macaulay duration a modified version of macaulay duration is called modified duration so macaulay duration says weighted average time to recover my principal and coupon amount today time to break even modified duration is states that if this is the time taken how sensitive is your bond price to interest rate change so modified duration is nothing but take macaulay duration divided by 1 plus ytm for a bond fund or a fixed income fund if it is a security it is modified duration divided by 1 plus ytm by n where n stands for the frequency of coupon payment what is modified duration it indicates how sensitive your bond portfolio is or your fixed income security is to interest rate changes higher the duration that means longer the time to break even for example there are two bonds one uh, pays 
both the bonds say for example pay 10% coupon but one matures in 10 years the other matures in 2 years which means the other that matures in 2 years will you will get your cash flow faster the concept of time value of money then kicks in and you could utilize your cash flows that you have used for better purposes. Now, what if there are two bonds of same maturity? One pays a monthly coupon, one pays a yearly coupon. The one that pays you monthly coupon gives you monthly cash flow and that cash flow could be better utilized for some other purposes and compounding effect than the bond that gives you a yearly cash flow. So duration formula has various ingredients. It is just not dependent on maturity. Uh, uh, it is dependent on coupon, coupon time, whether it is fixed, floating, half yearly, yearly, monthly, frequency of coupon, coupon, maturity, all this is taken in this funnel of duration and therefore first you get modified Macaulay duration and modified version of Macaulay duration is called modified duration, which is nothing but du Macaulay duration divided by 1 plus YTM by N. So, how do we utilize it? So modified duration multiplied by change in interest rate. For example, we know that what if interest rates have moved up by 1%? If interest rate moves up, the existing bond prices falls. But the question is to what degree it should fall? What should the extent by which it may fall? Now, does it fall by 1%? Does it fall by 2%? Does it fall by 0.25%? Now, the degree of that impact is captured by modified duration, which means take the modified duration of the bond instrument or the fund multiplied by the change in interest rate. That will tell whether the NAV will move up or move down. For example, imagine there is a bond fund that has a three-year Macaulay or modified duration and interest rates have moved up. If it moves up, the price has to fall down. Therefore, we have mentioned a minus sign. But to what extent the price has to move down? Will it move down by 3%? Will it move down to by 2%, by 1%? It will move down here. All you have to do is multiply the duration with the interest rate change. And here we get a minus 3% impact. What if the interest rates decreases? So there is an opportunity. Why should we only talk about somber happenings? We could talk about optimistic ha happenings also. So what if uh, you know, the Monetary Policy Committee has been reducing repo rates continuously? There has been actions taken by Reserve Bank of India in the format of forex swaps, OMOs to inject liquidity in into the king's to good liquidity, interest rates falling, and if interest rates have to fall and the product has three-year duration, three into 0.5, the gain is going to be 1.5. So just to explain, both Macaulay and Modified are the same. Now, Macaulay means the weighted average maturity to recover all your future cash flows today. What is modified? It is a modified version, which basically tells how sensitive the instrument is to interest rate changes. Now, duration has limits. It does not take the impact of credit rating. So it basically is a paper tiger that actually, uh, you know, gives a relationship between interest rate and price, which is a straight line relationship. But in reality, it could be a convex. That is why convexity is a better measure. And convexity as of now is not uh, mandated by SEBI for mutual funds to publish that data. But it's a very, very powerful data. If that comes in, it gives you exactly the, the opportunity to make more returns or the opportunity to be into shorter duration funds where you can shield your investment from interest rate movements. So longer the duration, higher is the interest rate sensitivity, shorter the duration, lesser is the interest rate sensitivity. So if you're expecting interest rates to rise, let's conduct a quick knowledge check. What action do you think will improve your risk return profile? Would you look at increasing the portfolio duration to capture the price rise or would you look at decreasing the portfolio duration to capture the low price fall? What exactly would you be doing? Imagine 
interest rates are expected to be uh, expected to rise liquidity is expected to fall what is the action that you would be taking to improve the risk return profile i'll pause for a few seconds before i publish the answer i would request all of you for your active participation kindly utilize the chat pane All right, thank you so much. Heartening to see a lot of responses. Yes, if interest rates are supposed to rise, you would be decreasing portfolio duration because as we said, lesser the duration, lesser is the interest rate risk, higher the duration, higher is the interest rate risk. So how do we choose the right debt fund? Very important to understand the concept of credit risk and interest rate risk. Understand which, what is the risk appetite. Now, when we're talking about equity, we talk about risk tolerance and risk capacity. We talk about an investor or us being aggressive, moderate, uh, conservative in our risk appetite, uh, you know, uh, in our risk appetite disposition. But when it comes to selecting a debt fund, understand which, what is the risk appetite of the client in the context of, uh, you know, the investor being able to take fathom credit risk or the investor being able to fathom interest rate risk. What is the time horizon? Remember, we did an activity where we spoke about yield or the net yield to be precise to be a starting point yes net yield is important but very very important is to understand the time frame of the client and then you could look at taking a view utilizing modified duration and the concept of bond immunization so know your client know yourself and which risks matters the most so for example uh, Let's do another problem. It's a very interesting problem. Imagine Mr. Dravid has requested you to choose for him a good debt fund. Your profiling suggests that he's an extremely conservative individual who's worried about adverse interest rate movements. If you have to pick one fund, which fund would you be picking and, and why? And here you have the fund names. There is a star fund. There is an A plus fund. There is a solid guilt fund. There is a super fund. Here are these uh, repository of funds, a bouquet of funds. If you have to pick one fund, which fund would you be picking and why? Again, I'll take a few seconds pause before um, uh, I proceed and we discuss as to which fund we will be uh, picking but what what are your thoughts around it which fund would you be picking and why all right thank you so much for your lovely responses always remember past returns is not an indicator of future returns. Past is past. We need to understand what kind of a fund it is. For example, if the past return is 14%, happens to be a duration fund, the biggest driver for that return has been capital appreciation. And until and unless you're very sure that the interest rate climate is going to be conducive, and the monetary policy stance from the uh, central bank is going to be dovish. We cannot be expecting a 14% return the next year also, which means that past returns is, is, is giving a good uh, perspective, but it does not give a holistic perspective. So we, we, we will not be looking at past returns. It's very clear that the client does not understand the impact of volatile interest rate climate impacting his NAV. So in this case, we just discussed before that duration is an interest rate risk indicator. It indicates how sensitive the bond fund is or the bond instrument is to price uh, to interest rate changes, which means we will be giving super fund because it has the least modified duration. So let's consider this concept of bond immunization. I've got, uh, you know, this and the other one before we wrap up the session and open uh, the broadcast for Q&A. Uh, what is this bond immunization? So bond immunization is, uh, imagine uh, your goal is to accumulate corpus for funding your child's college fees, uh, which, which the, that means the goal is child college fees 
child college fees is the goal and that will uh, concretize five years down the line so bond immunization is buying bonds which will be maturing in five years so this year you buy a bond which will um, uh, you know mature in 2024 the next year you buy a bond which will mature in uh, which will have a maturity of four years the three years uh, three years down the line you buy a bond which will mature in three years which means the maturity date of the bonds are identical and you try to buy instruments so that they give cash flows when the need is required or the when the need is concretizing so that is the concept of uh, you know it is called bullet strategy it is called portfolio construction bullet strategy now how can we use bullet strategy to our advantage is you know uh, uh, it's always good you know it's human nature to react and uh, if you deep dive into the concept of behavioral economics and the psychological angle people are susceptible to availability bias which means we take decisions basis events that we can easily recall and they have to be dramatic for example the allen fs crisis there's a liquidity crunch etc every day there are newspaper reports and we view the entire nbfc in all negative light without really understanding that there could be great nbfcs and now since there's so much of negativity it's all being factored in, in and the yields could be much higher. I don't want to color your mind, but what exactly I, I would like to drive the point is that sometimes we are vulnerable to recency bias, which is also called as availability bias. We take decisions, basis, events we can easily recall, and they have to be shiny, they have to be scary, they have to be dramatic. Now, when interest rates, for example, move up, obviously NAV falls. The degree of fall depends upon duration. But did we realize that when NAV falls or the price falls, the white tier moves up? So what is very important is to understand that when are these actions happening? And if we could look at considering the investment tenure and the point at which this interest rate change takes place. So here comes utilizing bond immunization strategy to our advantage. It is primarily to shield portfolio from, from interest rate risk, which is match the portfolio duration to the investment time frame. So it minimizes interest rate risks to a substantial extent. For example, what if the YTM of a fund is 10%? There is an expense ratio, say, of around 2%, which means the net yield hypothetically works around 8%. What if the fund had a duration of two years, which which means the weighted average time required for the fund to break even to get all its cash flows of the underlying securities in the portfolio is two years. What if you came into this fund for a six month time frame? Now, that's where, you know, positioning of the fund is not apt. When a fund has a modified duration of two years and the time frame is short, in fact, when you're redeeming, what if there is an interest rate hike or there is an adverse event that happens? Say three months down the line, the, you know, there is a liquidity crunch and rates have moved up by 50 basis point. So the expected CAGR that the fund will generate is 6%. Now, the net yield is 8%. And all these, while we were talking about yield, whatever is the yield, that would be the returns. Well, it further, you know, um, granularizes itself into accrual and duration, etc. But when the time frame was six months, we saw that the return is just 6%. And that leads to dissatisfaction. That leads to expectations not being met. But what if you, we looked at the portfolio characteristics of a fixed income fund? And we decided that well, the, that, well, if the fund has a duration of two years, I have to come for a 24 months time frame. And the proposed tenure of investment is now, is now matched to the uh, duration modified or Macaulay duration of the product. You could use any of those variables. Both are apt. And when you come for a two years time frame and there is this incident of a 50 basis point interest rate hike, the collateral damage in terms of your expectations not being met has been contained, has been reduced. For example, the expected CAGR over the next 24 months is around 7.89, which if not equivalent to the net yield of the fund is around net field 
net yield of the fund. So one important thing is, and we should thank from the, so for a portfolio, we look at assets, we look at liabilities. So for us, uh, uh, you know, whenever we construct portfolios, we use a laddered approach or a staggered approach. For example, uh, let's take this example of a fund which has a two years modified duration. So we will buy some bit of securities that are maturing in six months, some bit of securities that are maturing in one year, but some bit of securities which are maturing in one and a half years and then two years. That means we stagger the maturity profile and that helps us to deal with liquidity risk. We also, uh, thanks to the taxation structure change where the long term capital gain tax is applicable provided that investors into fixed income mutual funds come for three years, you know, that has led to a lot of investors coming for a three year time frame. We also on the liability side, which is from the investors perspective, how many investors are redeeming, whether the retail investor will get affected or not, ensure that we have good enough exit loads. For example, uh, you know, Swaroop can later, later on share about the exit load features of our fund. When it comes to a credit risk fund, we expect investors to come for three years time frame and we have exit loads up to three years because we do not want people to redeem somebody redeeming a big amount and the existing investor getting affected so we ensure that we uh, you know we look beyond credit ratings we look at uh, you know studying the asset and the liability side of the portfolio well so that end of the day the unit holders interest is protected so a bit about market resilience, be it monetary tightening, monetary easing. Remember, we spoke about accrual funds being all-weather solutions. So this is one such short duration fund. As per SEBI's mandate, we are supposed to maintain a one to three years Macaulay duration. And it seems that be it the phase of monetary tightening or the phase of monetary easing, where there was liquidity, there wasn't liquidity, uh, where there were interest rates being on the lower side, interest rates being on the higher side. Uh, 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 the fund has given a worst return of 7.4 percent and in monetary policy uh, you know periods when the, uh, the when there was an easing action it has given less uh, it has given more but more more than that what is very important is this concept uh, we find that people do not match the proposed tenure with until and unless you're very good in macroeconomics studying macroeconomic trend and studying capital markets to the T you could look at some tactical allocation, but there should always be a core and satellite approach. The core should be funds where your investment tenure, at least if not more, is equivalent to the duration of the fund. That is a basic discipline that we, we urge uh, investors to maintain, and that's, that's the reason why our exit loads are structured in that format. Now, taxation of uh, uh, fixed income mutual funds, again, a quick trivia. I would request the, uh, the August audience uh, attending this beautiful uh, program and sharing their uh, time to uh, utilize the chat pane to answer. Could you identify what is the correct statement of indexation? Uh, is it the final investment value that is adjusted for inflation? Is it the purchase price that is adjusted for inflation? Or is it the purchase price which is adjusted by WPI GDP deflator? What do you think is the correct statement for indexation? I'll take a few seconds pause before we publish the answer. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, indexation concept is that the purchase price is infl inflated. It is adjusted for inflation. So, so uh, what is the indexed cost of acquisition is the purchase NAV multiplied by the cost of inflation index of the year of sale divided by the cost of inflation index of the year of the purchase. So uh, indexation is inflating the purchase price. Uh, you could get the cost of inflation index data from in income tax india.gov.in and therefore it's not the per uh, the purchase price but the indexed cost of acquisition which is deducted from sale price and then you get a capital gain so here is the taxation i just thought for the benefit of the larger audience and i'm sure that Zirudha has done a lot of efforts and um, you know uh, educating investors about uh, the taxation of mutual funds but i felt uh, you know for the benefit of the larger audience to mention that so when it comes to fixed income mutual funds uh, if the holding period is up to three years it's considered to be a short-term gain. 
only when the uh, uh, holding period is more than three years or 36 months, it's considered to be a long term gain. And then the purchase price is adjusted for indexation. And then there is a 20 percent taxation that is that is charged onto it so uh, it's it's just for a hypothetical case just to uh, assume that so what what is very important is that your your return should be net of expenses net of taxation net of charges that's that's how the wealth creation is made so if there are identical products with the same uh, ytm uh, it's very important to do that analysis is that what is my net, net of tax returns? And in this case, it comes that the investment amount has got indexed and there is an index cost. Therefore, even if the pre-tax maturity amount in this case, if it was 12.25 lakhs, it gets, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 the subtraction happens with the index cost, which means 12.25 lakhs minus 11.91 lakhs, the capital gain is less. And that if it is not available in your product, it could be an FD, it could be something else, then it becomes tax inefficient. So very important about debt is tax efficiency, uh, you know, uh, matching the investment time frame, understanding the concept of yield, uh, you know, and understanding what's the fund all uh, fund objective all about. So there was a time when, uh, you know, income funds give beautiful returns just after currency replacement program was incorporated. It's because there was a, f there was a, uh, you know, inundation of liquidity in the banking system. And there was a good rally which happened uh, in the bond prices and the yields were compressed. So that resulted in great returns for one year. But that wasn't the case when people looked at the past returns and invested into the into the future. So uh, past is past. We have to look at the, the objective. What's the net yield? What is the duration? Match our time frame accordingly. So I, I, I will be ending the program at this juncture. Just to summarize, I hope uh, uh, my due apologies uh, if there were a uh, bit of uh, interruptions in the in the middle and the starting glitches that we had. So uh, you know, our due apologies from Franklin Templeton for that. Uh, for, for that. Uh, but thank you so much for your active participation and giving me so much time and listening to me. I hope that, that at the end of this program, um, I was able to share clarity around right from the basics. What's a bond? What, what do you mean by a bond contract? What are the key characteristics? How do we differentiate between YTM and EEL? What are the different types of bonds? What are the different types of bond funds? What do we mean by credit risk, interest rate risk? What do we mean by duration? What's the difference between a Macaulay and a modified duration? And some nuances about selecting debt funds and the taxation of debt mutual funds. So uh, a final knowledge check. I will be sharing four questions before we conclude the program. Uh, please use the chat pane uh, and would request your active participation. Question number one is, how is the sensitivity of bond prices to interest rates measured? Is it standard deviation? Is it modified duration? Is it alpha? Is it beta? I'll take pause for a few seconds. Would request uh, audience to share their views using the chat window. All right, so the sensitivity of bond prices to interest rate is measured by duration. It could be Macaulay, it could be modified. Standard deviation is dispersion of returns from the mean. And when we are talking about alpha and beta, they are modern portfolio, uh, uh, you know, statistics, they are model portfolio characteristics. So they are basically synonymous more with equity funds and not with debt funds. So sensitivity of bond prices or NAV of bond funds to interest rate change changes is measured through duration. Now, this is an interesting question. So what if a fund has a duration of three years, has a YTM of 8% and interest rates have moved down by 1%? To what extent do you think the NAV will rise or fall? And your options are, A, it'll rise by, it'll fall by 3%. B, it'll rise by 3%. C, it may not change at all, or D, it may fall marginally. I'll take a pause for a few seconds and we'll wait for your answers.
Thank you so much for your answers. The correct answer is that if interest rate falls by 1% and the fund duration is that of three years, all we have to do is three multiplied by one, there would be a 3% gain in NAV, but it is going to be a rise. So the NAV rises by 3%. What does a bond rating indicate is the third question. And the options are, does it indicate default risk? Does it indicate repayment risk? Does it indicate market risk? Or does it indicate interest rate risk? I'll take a pause for a few seconds. Thank you for your participation. A bond's rating is assigned by CRAs and it indicates default risk. Final question is a true or false. Net YTM, which is called net yield to maturity, is a good starting point to estimate the expected returns from a debt fund. Do you think that the statement is true or do you think that the trade statement is false? Please share your thoughts using the chat pane. I will take a few pause for a few seconds. All right, thank you so much for uh, you know making it very interactive. It is, if not a great starting point, it is a good starting point. I will not say great, if not a holistic starting point, it is definitely a good starting point, provided that we know what is the objective of the fund. There are 16 categories of debt funds available. What is the objective? What is the duration? How is it managed? And if there are two funds with identical objective, identical style of management, then net YTM is a good starting point to estimate the expected returns from a debt fund. With this, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, uh, you know, a big thank you to the team of Zerodha for inviting Franklin Templeton to conduct this uh, program on fixed income investing. Thank you so much. I will pause at this juncture. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Amrita. I think you were very comprehensive in your presentation. And uh, I think just uh, because somebody who's new to the markets might want to know what is the least risky way to invest in a bond or in a debt mutual fund, how would they do, do that to find the least risky way to do it if they had to? Uh, so, um, uh, uh, Mohit, um, there are variety of debt funds available as I was showing uh, a slide which has 16 categories. The, the fund which has the least interest rate risk and the credit risk is an overnight fund which has a Macaulay duration of one day. Uh, yeah. There are liquid funds, there are short dura there are low duration funds, ultra short duration funds. And uh, so those are the funds which have less of uh, uh, interest rate risks. And because the maturities are low, the credit risk and the liquidity risks are on the lower side. Very important is that when you're looking at these funds, the good starting point has to be net YTM. Uh, thank you. I think that makes sense. Just to reiterate uh, something that you had spoken about earlier, uh, you spoke about key parameters that uh, somebody who's investing could look at when they are choosing a debt fund. Uh, could you just elaborate on that as well? Because I think one of the things that uh, people who are new to these might want uh, to be guided on, if not uh, directed on, just some form of guidance in some way. Uh, sure. So uh, let me see if I have some slides, uh, you know, just to explain that perspective. Yes. So a um, couple of things is that uh, very important is what is the fund? Is it is it a medium duration fund? Then you know that it would obviously maintain a Macaulay duration of more than three years. Uh, and if it maintains a higher Macaulay duration, there is an element of interest rate risk. So very important to understand what is the objective of the fund. Second is that uh, these are market-linked products. 
obviously buying securities not just from the primary market but buying securities from the secondary market so there will be mark to market impact on the nav so uh, to what extent uh, you know an investor can take interest rate risk or credit risk has to be looked at so again that gets linked to the objective of the fund important is to look at the objective second is look at uh, consider the uh, you know basis objective for example if a if, if an investor uh, doesn't want to uh, get into managed credit space so what is managed credit space is buying securities which are not rated triple a they could be rated triple a or double a plus below now right. if the client does not want to get into those kind of securities well there are high credit portfolios like corporate bond portfolios available which has uh, you know much more cleaner names and uh, higher rated papers so one is the construct of the portfolio in terms of credit rating the important aspect is what's the objective what is the net yield because that is going to give an indication as to what's the expected return from the fund and then look at the modified duration so we always uh, you know encourage people to match their investment time frame around the modified duration so here is a three step process so imagine there are two funds which have the uh, you know uh, an identical net yield of 8% one fund has say a duration of 3 years the other has a duration of 5 years and the client's time frame is 3 years so uh, and uh, uh, he would like to take a calculated interest rate risk weighing the pros and the cons and it may be that the interest rate outlook is quite hawkish for the next 3 to 6 months now they, what i would suggest is a three three step process first is uh, you know pick up what is the net yield of both the funds in this case both the funds has the same net yield of 8% which means it's a level playing field second is what's the duration of the fund and in this case we know that one fund has a 3 year duration the other is five other other has other has a 5 year duration we have to do an interest rate analysis for example what's the best case scenario what's the worst case scenario what's the fa fallback scenario so the best case is that if interest rate falls fund a obviously gives higher uh, gain than fund b in worst case scenario it is fund a that falls more than fund b and in a neutral uh, case of fallback scenario where the, the rates are on a status quo mode both funds give an 8% return then you know this kind of an analysis it's very important as i've said i was quoting the, uh, dr daniel kahneman who was actually who's an who's a psychologist who was awarded nobel prize in economics right. and it's it's, a, it's it, he basically advocates wealth management firms the first question to ask is how much loss can you take are you in for a 3% return if you are in for a 3% return as much as you know everybody wants the best of the best return if your range of return expectation is 3 to 11 you know then uh, you know uh uh, uh Uh, 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 then a particular fund is meant for you. Right. So it's very right. important to know what's the. It, it's very important to conduct a interest rate analysis. So just to summarize it, uh, objective is very important. Portfolio character, portfolio, the quality of papers are very important. Um, net yield, Macaulay duration, and interest rate analysis. And lastly, uh, a good process is what is required. If if a fund house has a, a, you know good credit appraisal mechanisms, they they have done checks and balances both on the asset and the liability side. If there is a strong, robust process uh, involved, then a lot of risks gets mitigated. Uh, thank you, Amrita. Thank you for taking out your time and uh, doing this for everybody here. Uh, I think everyone who was a part of this had a lot to take away. Uh, we'll organize another one which will have some advanced topics that Amrita will be able to address. Uh, thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much, Mohit, uh, for giving uh, FT an opportunity to uh, you know participate with Zerodha. So we appreciate uh, the partnership, and thank you everyone for for logging in. Uh, just to uh, end the pr program, uh, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. So uh, you know, Sir John Templeton says that the more you uh, accept that you are low on knowledge, the deeper we'll go into it and 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 get clarity about it. So yes, so thanks so much for taking. your time out for this uh, broadcast